Good evening. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you who have joined us this evening at the Museum of Science. This is one of our programs this season, expounding on the theme of Lessons from Pompeii, related to the museum's A Day in Pompeii exhibit. Tonight, we are thrilled to present isotope geochemist and volcanologist Dr. Kenneth Sims, a man who lives on the edge, literally. What started as a passion for mountain climbing evolved into an academic pursuit for understanding the scientific inner workings of the earth. When he isn't mountain biking, skiing, teaching at the University of Wyoming, or spending time with his family, he can be found collecting molten lava from various volcanoes around the world. Dr. Sims studies the chemical makeup of lava to search for answers regarding Earth's paleoclimate, oceanic and continental growth, and continental crust weathering. But most importantly, his research makes it possible to study the evolution of volcanic systems, and his findings have the potential to save the lives of those living near active volcanoes, information from which the Pompeians would have greatly benefited. With the help of his friend and colleague, veteran photojournalist John Cateau, Dr. Sims' scientific adventures have been, carefully, have been beautifully and carefully documented. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing about those scientific adventures firsthand. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kenneth Sims. This on? Yeah. Magma genesis is one of the most fundamental dynamic processes in the Earth. If you think about it, the Earth's chemical internal structure, core, mantle, crust, the Earth's surface features, the Earth's ocean, and the Earth's atmospheres are in large part a function of the magmatic processes that are occurring within. So when you think, people often think about us volcanologists in terms of understanding when a volcano is going to erupt, but there's a real basic science message in that we're really trying to understand how the Earth evolved and has developed through time, and um, it, it has important implications. As you see here, of course, the Earth isn't unique in that regard. A lot of the pl um, planets in the solar system and also um, some of the moons of Jupiter's moon of Io have volcanic processes occurring. Olympus Mons on Mars is the tallest volcano in the world. And you can see large lava flows, of course, on, on Venus and, and plume-like structures there that where uh, we have upwelling of lava. And then, of course, um, Jupiter's moon Io is very active and of great interest. And here you can actually see a picture of a plume of an, a volcanic eruption happening on the surface of Io. And if you look at the Earth, the Earth is actually, of course, it's, it's riddled with volcanics. If you start to look at the oceans, the ocean ridges here where the, the, there's a divergent boundary, and all of that is all magmatic processes. The crust of our Earth has been made by magmatic processes, and I would argue that the Earth's mid-ocean ridge systems are the largest magmatic system in the solar system. Although Olympus Mons is the tallest volcano the Earth is twice, has twice the diameter of Mars, and therefore if you cube that, then of course uh, Mars has an eighth the volume of the Earth. And here's this magmatic system that runs around the Earth in a divergent boundary. And this is the primary magmatic system in the Earth. But of course then there's also all these um, ridges um, that form along here, known as the, you know, this is the Peru Chile Trench, and, and you have the, the Ring of Fire. That's all subduction zones. It's the Earth going through a convection process. The Earth is trying to cool. It started out very hot, and it's continuing to cool through time. There's lots of processes that keep it warm, but um, it's that temperature gradient between space and the inside of the Earth that are driving the magmatic processes that are occurring. And if you start to look at volcanoes, they're not all the same. They have all sorts of different shapes. And you'll see here, we can have sort of composite volcanoes that are very strato-like. Well, here's actually a, a cone that formed out in the middle of a field there, mud volcanoes, um, this is in the Aleutians and so forth. They all have different shapes that are very characteristic of their styles of eruptive processes as well as where they're being formed. Um, places like Hawaii tend to have typically these very low angle shield volcanoes. And then if you go to um, 
the, the arcs and so forth, you have these very large volcanoes that occur that are much more um, steep sloped and have much more explosive volcanism. So you know, if you have these fissure eruptions, they tend to be effusive and not nearly as dangerous, unless of course you live in the region where this fissure is, as opposed to these large plinian and um, very large kind of volcanism. And so they have different kinds of, of um, eruptive processes and it's really important to know this distinction and to be able to understand how these volcanoes are, con are affecting us as people and also just basic pure science. We underestimate the value of pure science and in basic pure science we're trying to understand this from a fundamental level and then take that and apply it to our actual um, the system in order to better understand eruptions. This is a plot here. This is the types of eruptions of explosiveness versus the height of the eruption column. And of course you can see Hawaiian volcanism is not very, um, doesn't put out very large eruption columns. It's very effusive, whereas if you have these very explosive vulcan, volcanic processes, they can um, affect a lot of the Earth. And I'm going to talk about that tonight. I'm going to talk about how the volcanoes can affect our atmospheres as well as our lives. Here I've listed what at the time I put this together was the sort of consider the 10 top you know, deadliest volcanoes. And of course, if you start to look at it, you have Tambora all the way down to Vesuvius, which is sort of on the low end of the scale. But you can see they've been devastating to communities, to, for instance, Pompeii. They, um, they've had this major of effect, and we need to understand it in order to protect the people that live in these communities. Because the interesting thing is, People want to live on volcanoes because they bring up new earth, so they're very fertile. And as a volcanologist, you're trying to actually spend time understanding this volcanic system so you can predict an eruption. And we're really good now, and I'll, I'll tell you this, we are extremely good at predicting when a volcano is about to erupt in the short term. It's the long term that's hard. You know, This volcano is going to erupt in 25 years, it's going to erupt in 10 years. That's where we struggle. But as I'll show you, we're, our ability to erupt or predict eruptions at Pinatubo was phenomenal and saved tens of thousands of lives. And uh, as I say we, I really credit my colleagues with the, from the United States Geological Survey who actually um, sort of went through a big orientation and developed a VDAP program called Volcano Disaster Assistance. And um, they actually have, they were phenomenal. And Pinatuba was one of their great successes. And here's, this is actually from Pinatubo. And um, you can see there's, you know, the, the implications of volcanic eruptions are phenomenal. So what are the hazards associated? You have magma that comes up. And the process of generating this magma is, um, is really just the way the Earth is trying to cool and undergoing mantle convection. But once you bring this magma up, you can have lava flows. You can have um, these large pyroclastic. You put this eruption cloud up, can create acid rain. It can bring in all sorts of devastation. And you can, as the, when this eruption column collapses, it can create these pyroclastic flows that I'll show you. And um, you can see it here. And if that volcano is glaciated, or if you have a large eruption that's then preceded by a large rainstorm, because it's put all this ash out, you can have humongous mud flows. And this is, of course, what threatens, um, for instance, Puget Sound. In, if um, Mount Rainier were to erupt, and if you go down to Ecuador and look at those volcanoes, which is a place I study, there's humongous deposits um, that are prehistoric of these er eruptions. This happens to be, um, you can't get any better place for field work than Stromboli. You work in Stromboli, you walk up this mountain, you get this great exercise, and then you sit on the top and wait for the winds to come in, and then you collect your samples and gases, run out and collect the lava bombs, and then you go back down at night, and the whole economy of the island is oriented around tourists watching this, so you go back down to these phenomenal restaurants and drink a nice <laughs> bottle of wine. It just doesn't get better than that. And this is a, uh, an eruption that's happening on Etna down the uh, Valley Bole. And um, this is, you can see these lava flows. And of course, that's, that's a major threat. And people are often concerned about it. In fact, at the end of the slideshow, I'm going to talk about this volcano. This is the 2002 eruption from Nurungongo. And you can see it, of course, was quite devastating for the people that lived in the town of Goma. And this is 
a large eruption. These are actually ones that we've had a hard time product, um, predicting because they're phreatic. A little pocket of steam all of a sudden exceeds its confining pressure, and voila, it erupts. And people, of course, in this case, this is a major tourist volcano. And these people were all from a cruise ship that took buses up there. And there's actually a Discovery Channel about this. And um, the, the, one of the times I was interviewed, they showed me rappelling into it, juxtaposed to all these people re running away, screaming from this. No one was hurt except a few people that fell when they were running away and, and broke bones you know, as they were running off the, um, these high points and so forth. The scariest kind of eruption are these um, pyroclastic flows. And there's, they're very large, explosive. They put up this humongous eruption column. And then that eruption column is being buoyed up by the heat. Eventually, it exceeds its potential to go up. Gravity pulls it down. And down come hot gases. And there, there's no outrunning these things. And um, they've been devastating for um, communities, Pompeii, as well as several volcanologists. The Crafts, for instance, who have created some of the best movies ever of volcanic eruptions through the decades were unfortunately killed on Mount Unzen when, they, when this, um, these kinds of eruptions happened. And they were, um, it, was, it was really unfortunate um, because they thought they could helicopter this high point and it sort of the pyroclastic flow jumped and that was um, the, the demise of the crafts. And of course, they've since named a medal for people that are in media related to studying volcanology named after the crafts. So if you look at this, you know, first thing that you have to worry about besides lava flows and pyroclastic flows is, of course, the ash. The ash is what you see with the pyroclastic flow. It's very fine, and it creates a total mess. It's very sharp. It's high silica content. And of course, it will spew out lots of ash, and that, was, that ash will collapse roofs, and it gets in people's lungs. I once had a person um, from Cambridge, Peter Baxter, AKA Dr. Death, who's a, a toxicologist who was studying um, the effects of volcanoes. And he asked me how much, because I study radioactive elements, how, how will the effect of radon be in this if you inhale a gram of ash? And I said, come on, Peter, think about it. You want to inhale a gram of ash and you're worried about the radon? Think about the silicosis. And, 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 so, and this is, it's interesting, I actually, when I pulled this picture up, I actually had to check the name of the town a couple of times, but this is indeed Ephrata, Washington. And this is the ash cloud from Mount St. Helens. And this is what Ephrata looked like the next day. And another issue you have to worry about, this is Stromboli, which uh, we, I just showed you a picture of. And um, volcanoes are oversteepened. And as a result of being oversteepened, gravity wins. It's the weak force, but it's actually the ultimate force. Gravity inherits the Earth. Um, and um, um, so as a result, there is this, these large lava flows that fell out and, uh, and um, came down, hit the ocean, and created humongous tsunamis. There's, it's a real problem that has been shown to exist throughout the globe. There's, um, in the Canaries, there's been humongous collapses on the volcanoes there that have created tsunami deposits that we can see in the east coast of the United States. It happens in Hawaii. These volcanoes oversteepen. They have water percolating through them, and eventually they slide, and um, you end up with large tsunamis and large landfall deposits that had nothing to do with the exact the immediate eruption, or if there, you know, it could be weeks, decades later that you have these these collapses. And of course, this is a picture of Mount Erebus. I spent a lot of time down there. This is in Antarctica, and. Um, and this is, you have to worry about the gases or be concerned about them because they do have this major contribution. You can see this is an active volcano. It's been active. Um, it has a lava lake inside of it um, that has been existent since the time we've ever been studying Mount Erebus, since the first flyovers. When Ross went down there, he actually saw um, the at, at night, which is six months down there essentially, he at night they when it started having um, night they started seeing a red glow up here. So this is a very long-term active volcano. Interestingly enough, the McMurdo Air F um, um, Base there that um, is the scientific base and used to be a naval base is right at, just beyond where I'm standing taking this picture and. Um, 
this is because of that, this is extremely well studied. It's, it's logistically well supported. I'm going back there next year to work on Mount Erebus. And it's a very unique composition of volcano. And this is actually, here you're looking at a plume. This is, um, that's the Straits of Messina. There's the, the tip of the boot of Italy. Berlusconi wants to build a bridge across there, which is sort of one of those bridges to nowhere. Um, and, um, and my Italian colleagues think he's crazy for the idea, but it's, it will generate a lot of money in someone's pocket. But anyways, here is, is what you're looking at is the, the, uh, the plume, the gas plume, not an ash plume, but the gas plume coming out of Mount Etna, which is a very active volcano. And of course, my Italian colleagues um, that I work with a lot there, um, this is, you know, down in here is Catania, and up here is Palermo, but Catania is immediately threatened by the eruptions of Mount Etna. And Mount Etna, of course, right now, looks like it has effusive lava flows, but there is, hist there is a history, not historical in terms of humankind, but there is a history within the volcano that shows that it's erupted explosively. And so it's very important to understand the history of a volcano. That is our key to understanding long-term predictions. You know, sort of essentially the present and the rock record is the key to the past. So as I talk about uh, the eruption clouds, you know, what do you have? The, the, the dominant species that come out of volcanoes are water, SO2 and CO2, and then there's minor species like um, hydrogen chloride, which is HCl, um, hydrochloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, and then of course the SO2, when it comes out, it eventually will turn into H2SO4, and that H2SO4 is very important in terms of um, both producing um, the potential for acid rain, but also it changes the, the temperature of the earth. It actually creates you end up with um, a, the albedo increases, so you end up with essentially um, a reflection, and it's a way to cool the Earth. And I'm going to show you this in a minute, that these large eruptions actually have a significant impact on the temperature of the Earth. And as a result, some people in, have suggested a geoengineering solution to climate warming, which is to just pump a whole bunch of SO2 up in there. I'm not a fan of geoengineering in this case. And there's a lot of uh, modeling now that would suggest that we have to be careful about that. But if you think about it, when I tell my classes that I'm teaching, you're an island nation that is going under. What's to stop you from trying to cool the earth and, and, and reverse the effects of climate warming? This is the new. Um, Halemaumau Mau eruption in Hawaii. This actually was, is a big, large crater that's been active. And now, as of about five years ago now, this reactivated. And you can see the plume that's coming out of this. This is highly toxic. I, have, I wear a gas mask explicitly when I get into these plumes. I have colleagues. I have a French colleague who smokes his cigarettes and says, oh, I love the smell of sulfur in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and, Unfortunately, I have some senior colleagues who have cardiopulmonary disease. So I wear a gas mask. And the, the folks at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory work in this plume every day. So I can't say enough about my USGS colleagues and how they're contributing to our understanding of volcanic systems and the, the, the sacrifices they're making. This is, is me taking a picture by John Cattle in the plume. And as you can see, I'm wearing a full face mask and um, you know, trying to work. And that plume will come and go, but we're measuring the gases out of it. And um, we're using pumps and so forth. In fact, one of my pumps that I have for a high volume pump is the standard dust buster. As my French call colleague calls it, it's the dust buster. And, um, you know, but it's, it's a, we're trying to pump this aerosols into through filter packs and so forth. I'll talk about that a little bit. So you have to, what's happened is, it's interesting, but now because of this, there is um, this VOG and this, these sort of health charts, and you don't need to spend a lot of time trying to focus on what I'm talking about here, but the, you know, the, the winds will blow the, the plume across here, and we've actually launched balloons into this plume to try and track the change from SO2 to H2SO4 and so forth, um, but this actually creates this VOG, 
and it creates asthma in children. It's, um, it's devastated the property values out here. It's, it's sort of amazing. So if, you know, if this system shuts down, this would be a good place to buy property right now, but um, there's no guarantee in that you want to live there. And it creates acid rain. This is a colleague um, from Michigan Tech, Simon Karn, who's, um, his, his work has been revolutionary in terms of using satellites to understand volcanic systems. And, and he also um, has sort of bothered me because he wants to go out in the field and, and work and get in field work, whereas he could sit in his desk all the time and look at satellite data. But this is Nurangongo, which I'll talk about at the end. And this is, we're on Naima Laguerre. We walked into the heart of the rebel territory. I'll, I'll show you a few slides from there. But this is what used to be the rebel territory stronghold right in here. We walked in there right in the middle of it and um, to collect some of the new flows there. These trees were destroyed by the actual eruption, but if you start to look off in the distance, all of these trees were destroyed by acid rain. And so, you, you know, it, it's, it's devastating. And of course, as I promised you, we're going to look at what the, the climate effects are, the global effects of volcanism. And this is the pristine atmosphere, and this is the volcanic aerosol after Pinatubo, which erupted on, if I'm if I remember correctly, June 15th, 1991. And you can see this is the, what it looked like before. This is what it looked like afterwards. I remember seeing a slideshow of Galen Rowles that had a red sunset in Antarctica. And I'm like, I thought he didn't color his slides. And then I remember he was there right after Pinatubo. And it actually, you could see the effects all the way down in Antarctica. In fact, if you look at this next slide, this is looking at what's known as optical depth, but this is before the eruption. And so, you know, here it is in April to May. The eruption was in June. And now, after this is from June 15, 1991, when the eruption happened through July, and you can see that the optical depth changed dramatically. It's getting um, shallower. And, um, and um, now you can see this is again, and um, we're looking at um, 91 in August to September. And even in 93 to 94, you can see the difference between before the eruption and after the eruption several years later. In fact, there's some phenomenal work that sort of shows that actually the temperature anomalies that can happen relative to, to the, you know, the mean temperature that was in, in 19, um, um, no, excuse me, 1960 or in that region, the mean temperature of, of essentially cooling um, that is a result of, um, of these eruptions. So it, it actually cools. And what's sort of cool, or I guess that's sort of um, a play on words, but what's interesting is if you look at this is the temperature anomaly um, in April, May, and June in 1991, and this here is the observed land surface air temperature, and these are model protection, predictions from global climate models. And what's phenomenal is it shows that the global climate models actually do a great job of predicting temperature. And you can see they match it night quite nicely. This is from um, work from Casper Ammon, who did his work at um, UMass um, Amherst, looking at that. The one thing that I will point out to you, and I, I think it's really essential to point this out, but this is CO2, and this is year, and this is the Keeling curve that, um, of course, Al Gore made famous. This is the change in the CO2 concentration of the Earth, and these are annual cycles that you're looking at the, the variations here, and you can see CO2 is going up, but volcanoes do not contribute to the, the, the global warming or the CO2 budget of the atmosphere. They contribute significantly to, to cooling when it comes to SO2, but they don't contribute to the CO2 of the atmosphere. And so, you know, if you sort of look at humans, um, emit about 27 billion tons of CO2 every year, whereas volcanoes emit about 130 million tons of CO2 every year. But they put out these volcanoes. They, For instance, Mount Etna puts out about 50% in SO2 of the global SO2 flux from coal-fired power plants. So the SO2 impact is phenomenal. It, um, there's platinum group elements. I measure platinum group elements. If you could put a sock over a volcano, you would have this phenomenal economically viable deposit from the platinum group elements coming out of it, but they don't contribute to CO2. And then the last hazard that you need to think about 
and um, if you work around a volcano, is this whole notion of the CO2, actually, because CO2 is heavier than air. In fact, in, in Yellowstone and in Nurungongo, where I work, the, the CO2 will get into these depressions. Kids will go into this in, in the African volcano, volcanic systems, and they die pretty much instantaneously from, from poisoning of their blood system. And of course, a real disaster happened here in uh, Lake Neos in Cameroon, where you had this, you know, this magmatic system, and the CO2 was coming up. But it was a very deep lake, and that CO2 accumulated because you know it, it's just like a soda bottle. You can pump your soda, your CO2 in your soda bottle, and then it, um, it, and you keep it under pressure. It's fine. You release that pressure, the CO2 is going to come out. Well, something caused the lake to overturn, and when it overturned, it released all its CO2. That CO2, being heavier than air, went down the valley and killed um, essentially 1,700 people and all the wildlife and didn't affect the vegetation. At first, it was a mystery, and then they figured it out, and it's, it's something to be very concerned about. The, the solutions to this are really simple. This is a problem in, in Lake Kivu, potentially, and essentially, you just sort of create a bubbling effect so you get the CO2 coming out. And um, now in um, Lake Kivu, they're actually mining methane, and that has that effect. So that effect is easy to mitigate. In terms of deaths, I think it's really sort of interesting to sort of look at this. This is, this is from Simpkin et al., a science paper in, in, in cumulative fatalities, and you'll see these are in years. And of course, the cumulative fatalities are going up for two reasons. There's m the population increases, and also our record keeping is, is getting better. But you can see there's these dramatic jumps, in particular Tambora, which I'll talk about here in a minute, and um, the Pele in, in 1902, um, Nevada de Ruiz in 1985, um, Lockheed in 1783 killed about 40% of the Icelandic population. Iceland, Iceland has about a population sort of like Wyoming where I live, so it's not hard to kill 40% of a small population, mind you. But it, um, it, this is also a, another one of those years without a summer because the effects were so phenomenal. This is sort of looks at the, the, you know, the percent based upon the total fatalities and the causes of these fatalities. And you can see that, of course, there's a lot of people that are, are, that are killed um, by these big pyroclastic flows, a little movie I showed you. But you also get out here into an important effect is famine and the tsunamis that I also talked about. Famine is, is a really important effect because the way the, the, the gases, the, the volcanic plume, changes the growing conditions. And also the, the HF, the fluorine that comes out of the volcanoes, creates fluorinosis. You know, if you put, you want your child to have a little bit of fluorine to make their teeth strong, you give them too much fluorine, their teeth start to rot. And of course, that has a major effect. So you, if your kid is getting fluorinated water, you don't give them fluorinated vitamins. And it's the same thing happens. The, 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 the grass you know, is destroyed. The sheep end up eating this stuff. They die. And of course, the, the, the fog and the fog from Lockheed made it hard for them to go out to, the, um, to do their fishing. And so as a result, the, if you look at how the time between eruption starts and the fatalities, initially, a lot of people are killed immediately. But it's then months to years afterwards when people are actually dying from these volcanic events. And that is famine. So given that, how do we start to categorize it? We're scientists. We want to group things, and we want to be effective in doing so. So we have something known as the Volcano Explosivity Index, VEI. And it goes from 0 to 8. And 0 is what Hawaii is undergoing right now. Kilauea, Piton de, de Florinace are sort of in the zero range. Eight is the mega colossal or the Yellowstone or Toba. Um, Tambora was a VEI seven and so forth. And to give you a perspective on this, this was created um, by the people that um, Self and, and um, Chris Newall, who designed the VEI index. But essentially, if you look at this, is the size of these spheres are relative to the size of the eruption. So you can see Pinatubo is a pretty significant eruption at VEI 6. But look at Yellowstone. In fact, if you watch enough TV, you're probably scared. And because um, there's, they call it the super volcano. And with good reason. But as you'll see, I'm going to address the probability of Yellowstone erupting. And so what I'm going to do now, 
This is modified after Newhall himself, who I said designed this VEI index, um, is I'm going to go through some examples from VEI 3 to VEI 8. And, and you can see sort of the effects. And you'll see the successes of volcanologists in predicting these eruptions and saving lives in many instances. So let's start with a VEI-3, Nevada del Ruiz in 1985. Not a uh, very large eruption in a relative sense. This, those, in fact, are sort of like a Richter scale. They're orders of magnitude. And of course, unfortunately, what happened is after the eruption, um, this, you know, there was all these pyroclastic flows and so forth, but um, there are um, plenty of eruptions. But then because of the, the glacier, you know, it was a glaciated mountain and so forth, this, one of these mud flows, these lahars, came down, and essentially it was 60 meters thick. If you think about that, that's phenomenal. And it caused 23,000 deaths. The town of Amero, Colombia, had a population of 30,000 people, and 23,000 of it of uh, those people were killed. And I live in a town of 27,000 people, and so it sort of it, it hits home in terms of what the devastation would be. So let's move next up to uh, Mount Pele, which is in um, the Caribbean. And they're only you know, 0.1 cubic kilometers of material. That's a VEI-4. And these occur about every 10 years. And more than 30,000 people died in St. Pierre from pyroclastic flows. It's an interesting story. But one of the two survivors it, um, was this guy, Louis Augustus Cypress. I was just looking at my notes to make sure I had it. But he's a felon in prison. And he survived probably because of where he was. And um, so that's a picture of him. And you can see he is, of course, burned. And this is the, the, his prison cell that he was in. Now let's move up to an eruption that we're really familiar with. And that is Mount St. Helens. It's erupted in 1980. It was a VEI-5. And uh, people around the United States saw its effect every sunset, every sunrise, because it put, um, produced a large um, cloud of high up in the stratosphere. And, but what was amazing here was because the USGS and other volcanologists were monitoring this so well, only 57 people died from this lateral blast. And this is what it looked like. And then you can see the blast happening as we go along here. And it was devastating. Unfortunately, some of those 57 people, well, one guy um, of those 57 people was a, a USGS geologist. And um, it was interesting because the day that the eruption happened, he switched out with another geologist um, because the other geologist had an impacted tooth. And so um, the guy with the impacted tooth was actually sort of lucky in that, I guess. But, but it was devastating to lose his colleague who was actually making these measurements. And unfortunately, the guy who had the impacted tooth then went on and was killed in Unzen, Japan, with the crafts. And now we're getting up to VEI-6, Mount Pinatubo. And you can see this is one of those pyroclastic flows. The person in this truck did not survive, um, nor did the cameraman who took this picture. But anyways, only 800 people were killed. This is, you know, these are larger, you know, again, 10 cubic kilometers. And they occur about every 100 years. 800 people died, mostly from collapsing roofs. But what was amazing was 60,000 people were evacuated. They were that good at predicting it. They got 60,000 people out of there. And it would have been devastating, not only from the pyroclastic flows, but also lahars because a typhoon hit the day of the major eruption. And so you know that shows the success of our short-term prediction. Now let's move to a volcano that uh, occurred before we could actually make this prediction, um, and that's Mount Tambora. And this is a VEI-7. We're almost up at the super volcanoes here. 100 cubic kilometers of material were expelled. These occur about every 1,000 years. And uh, Mount Tambora is the largest in recorded history. The death toll was at least 71,000, mostly from starvation and disease due to famine. And um, it created a global climate effects. And 1816 became known as the year without a summer. And um, so it, it was a, a very significant. And now we're going to prehistoric times in terms of um, the human um, perspective. And this is Mount, uh, this is Toba. It was erupted 74,000 years ago. It was a VEI, the super volcanoes. And of course, th here there was 2,800 cubic kilometers of material ejected. These occur about every 10 to 100,000 years. And this is probably the most explosive eruption in the past 25 million years, even bigger than Yellowstone. And the pyroclastic flows destroyed 20 
20,000 square kilometer, um, or you know, destroy 20,000 square kilometers. It was an ash cloud, and I'll show you that in a minute. They extended beyond India, the humongous tsunamis. But interestingly, the two facts that I find most interesting, one is it actually um, cooled the earth by about three to three and a half degrees centigrade for several years. And you can see this up in, um, you know, there's the, the change in carbon sequestra sequestration levels in the Greenland ice core. And there's some mitochondrial DNA evidence that shows that the human population was reduced significantly during this, this eruption. And here's an example of the, the eruption. You know, here's the ash cloud extent. Here's the pyroclastic flows. You can see that this actually covers up in India, and these are all of tsunami deposits or possible tsunami um, impacts from that. And this just shows it again. This is the plume from Pinatubo. This is the plume from Tambora. Both of those are historical. And this is the, the ash plume from Toba. You could see it was phenomenal. So what about your neighbor, uh, Yellowstone? And of course, it's my neighbor. I live down here, and I spend a lot of time up there working lately. This is a you know a, a artist rendition of the super um, eruption, and part of the Discovery Channel. And if you start to look at it and look at its effect of its ash cloud, it was a VEI eight, and it, you can see that um, this is the, this, there's three eruptions: the Mesa Falls, the Huckleberry Ridge, and the Lava Creek. And you can see this is the ash deposits that resulted from the Yellowstone deposits each year. Also, the Long Valley Caldera is another significant volcano. And if you compare that to Mount St. Helens in 1980, it's, it's something to be afraid of if it erupts. I sit on this Yellowstone Volcano Observatory um, panel this year that was um, a tabletop exercise. And it's, it was really interesting to work with um, the folks at the USGS who spent their career dealing with this as a disaster um, kind of program. And in fact, if you look at this, this is a, you know, looking at relative eruption magnitudes. And here you can sort of see over here, here's Pinatubo and St. Helens and, and Nova Erupta. You know, these are all 20th century eruptions. And here's 19th century eruptions, Tambora, Krakatoa. And here is our Yellowstone volcano and our Long Valley. And interestingly enough, this is why people sort of say, be afraid of Yellowstone. Because if you look at this, this Huckleberry Ridge, which is the biggest one, erupted 2.1 million years ago. Um, Mesa Falls, 1.3. And Lava Creek, 640,000 years ago. So there's this periodicity of about 700,000 years. Well, when was the last one? About 700,000 years ago. So. But we're scientists. We don't just base it on you know, a couple numbers. In fact, the statistics of small numbers make the probability extremely small. And it's just because of the small numbers, but it makes it extremely small when you run the real numbers. And this was done by um, a scientist Christensen et al., Jake Lowenstern, and so forth. And essentially, the, their calculation showed that the basaltic lava flows, there's about 40 eruptions over 640,000 years. And their annual probability is about 6 times 10 to the minus 5. If you go up to rhyolitic lava flows, you're looking at a, a major eruptions of about 17 over 160. You know, these are big rhyolitic flows, but they're not the super one. They're all volcanoes are related to it. But again, you have a small annual probability. And then finally, this, this super eruption, the, the sort of the large caldera collapse, there's three caldera eruptions that have happened over 2.1 million years. The eruption interval, as I said, is about 700,000 years. But the annual probability, based upon just Two intervals or three eruptions is one times ten to the minus eight, and you know I tell my students I teach an intro uh, freshman course, and which is phenomenal and it's great. It's one of my favorite courses to teach, but I point out there's 200 students typically, maybe more in the audience, and the chances of when you're sort of born, the chance of being killed in a car wreck, is about one in a hundred, and um, of course it goes down as we get older because we get smarter that you can decrease those by not driving at night, not driving drunk, and wearing your seatbelt. So I contrast that with this and tell these students to wear their seatbelt because you know it's, that's where you can take charge of your life is wearing the seatbelt. The thing you have to be worried about in Yellowstone, and I, I spent a lot of time measuring these things, is hydrothermal explosions. There's 26 examples of hydrothermal explosions that have occurred in the past 126 years. And um, you know essentially, you can have um, Diameter of 100 meters can be expected. You know? So all of a sudden, these things just go off because this water is boiling under there. It gets confined and sealed up, 
and ba-boom. And there they can be significant. And so I, I must admit, if you walk around Yellowstone, you can think of that if you want to be fearful. <laughs> And here's a great um, illustration that I think was made by Jake Lowenstern. I should have put his name down there. But this is looking at, um, well, I did put the USGS in there. Um, but it's sort of just looking at the frequency and the destructiveness. And you can see there's sort of this inverse correlation in Yellowstone um, that you, know, you have to worry about these sort of less destructive, although they can be devastating if you're standing there relative to um, um, these caldera-forming eruptions. You know, for instance, um, you know, pork chop um, geyser went off unexpectedly and so forth. So what can we do about this? This is where I'm going to start to get into the pictures and people can see sort of the adventurous lifestyle that some of us live. But this is looking at, you know, sort of volcano monitoring. We monitor these volcanoes. We try and understand them so we can have successes like Mount St. Helens and Mount Pinatubo. And there's volcanoes all over the globe. I mean, they're, they're, they're just, you know, the globe is um, consists of thousands and thousands of volcanoes and they're constantly erupting and people want to live close to them or do live close to them because it's fertile soil and that's where they live. And so how do you tell someone in a third world country or even in a first world country, you've got to go. And if you tell them to go and then someone comes in and pilfers their house and then they come back because you were slightly wrong, will they go the next time? It's a, it's a real fine art. I just had this tabletop exercise for Yellowstone, and the national park was like, do we close the park? How do we evacuate? 50,000 visitors, you know, for an eruption. You know, these issues start to become, you know, that's where society and science cross. And so we use all sorts of um, processes, you know, various geophysical measurements, seismicity. We measure the gases. You know, we measure the temperatures of the water. Someone was telling me how the water has changed considerably amount, uh, around Mount Rainier just tonight when I was in the, um, sitting in the audience. And, you know, we can look at ground deformation. You bring new magma, the ground's going to go up. And um, we have satellites and so forth. And, of course, there's two ways to sort of do this when I talk about gas. And, and the first is if the gas increases, and the second if the gas shuts off. Because if the gas shuts off, watch out. There's something in the conduit that's closed in, and you're about to have an eruption. Ground deformation is, um, we're just getting phenomenal at this. I mean, GPS has revolutionized our world. And also, just looking at satellites. This is a, you know, you have these satellite passes. You look at the, the elevation of the ground, and then you do a pass again. And lo and behold, you can actually see changes. And this is called inferometry. And you can see here, this is Yellowstone Lake. You, you can see this dome has been growing there. I mean, that's why people are concerned about Yellowstone. It is changing, but it's an active volcano. Every volcano I've ever been on changes every year I go there. Um, mostly, um, um, it's a humbling experience to watch how they changed and where I was standing before. Um, and this just shows, this is, um, you know, looking at um, essentially ground motions, and these are up and sideways and so forth and even down because, you know, things um, buckle down as things go up. But this shows displacement um, that um, has been occurring. There's Yellowstone Lake again, and there's this earthquake swarm that occurred here, and this displacement is occurring north of there and also over here by West Thumb. And this shows, you know, the, the various seismometers and GPS stations that are all around. I mean, GPS is phenomenal, it's, what we can do with it. And it's, it's changed geology. We can understand tectonics better, and we understand um, how to predict volcanology. And of course, then the next thing, which I sort of specialize in, is measuring gases. So you can um, do it in situ. You can do it remotely. Um, and you can um, continuously monitor these gases. And so you can either be standing there measuring them like this, or you can fly over in helicopters and airplanes. Um, we use um, various spectrometers that actually compare what's the zenith sky, you know, what the sun, the, this wavelength coming out of the sun with what we actually measure now. And you can see this is a person with an SO2 camera on the Kilauea. And there's Mount Etna. On this year, on this, this particular day, we chose not to go up there because the seismicity increased and the SO2 flux increased. But typically, we go up there, and this is, you know, what it sort of, this is what the work entails. You're hiking up this hill, carrying car batteries in your back and, and so forth. It's actually great because you go back, you get great exercise, and then you go back and, and into um, the various villages around there and have a glass of wine. But you can see we've set up all these sampling devices around there. And, of course, you need power to use car batteries. And sometimes it's sort of clear like it is there, and other times 
you're barely breathing in these gases um, because it's so devastating. Something I've specialized in, we're moving into the pictures now, is actually um, going down in the volcanoes. This is um, a vulcan, um, volcano messiah, and here's um, a person standing, there's someone sitting there, Severine Moon and Pierre Gauthier, my colleagues, and they made measurements up there while I made measurements down inside, which is an important contrast. And of course, to get there, I use my climbing skills and um, so forth to go down in there. And um, you can sort of see, you go down these, and then this is a 1935 lava lake, and all this collapse has happened in the past 15 years. And in fact, I have um, pictures of me sitting on this rim <coughs> from this trip. Three days after we left, this rim collapsed way back. Um, and so I promised my wife um, <laughs> that when I'm next to the rim, I'd wear a rope instead of sitting there. I have a picture of me sitting there with my gear clipped in because I was worried about the wind, my feet dangling over the edge. Now I wear a rope and um, do my best to, um, to protect myself. And it's a phenomenal volcano. You can actually uh, measure gases right coming out of this conduit. There's very few places where you can make these kinds of measurements the way you can on um, Vulcan Messiah. In fact, this is an interesting place. In, eight, in 1558, excuse me, Friar Blas del Castillo went there, and he actually saw a lava lake, and he said, gold. And there's the Nirandiri crater, or a different crater. He saw this lava lake, and he said, gold. So they lowered him down, and he put on a bucket for a helmet, he, he um, drank some wine for, for courage and for uh, quenching his thirst, and then he spent time throwing this bucket out, and eventually he got some gold. But unfortunately, when he pulled it back, it wasn't gold, it was lava. And um, I contest he was one of the first volcanologists in North America, if not the first. This is Yellowstone. This is sampling gases in Yellowstone. This is actually after the park closed for a while this winter. And here we are sampling gases right there next to the road where we're not allowed to sample gases typically. Of course, the other thing you want to do when you start to study volcanoes is start to look at um, understanding the time sequence. How did this volcano erupt? when and, and how has it gone through? What is the cyclicity? Can you predict the cyclicity? And a very phenomenal success using this technique was Crandall, who said in 1975 that Mount St. Helens is the next volcano to erupt. In fact, it's going to erupt in the next 25 years. Well, that was 1975. Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. And that was based upon just looking at the geologic record. And, um, and so, you know, there's, that's long-term prediction, and then there's short-term. So, of course, I spend my time going up and down, collecting lavas within the craters and on the sides, and trying to understand this is Nurungongo. And also trying to collect the zero age. This is the 2006 eruption um, out of the southeast crater of, of Mount Etna. You can see the, the lavas going down there. All the volcanologists are standing back here, sort of where you guys are, these are the photographers. They're the ones who, and it was funny, you'd watch them that night, this photographer would move up here, well then these guys would move up here, and these guys, and then you go back the next day, there's bombs everywhere. And um, so they, they have to get their better photos, so they, they do a lot to get it. This is the lava river coming out, or coming out of that eruption. It's just gorgeous, these are all John Caddo photos. Well, the first day I went there, we wanted to sample. And uh, so I took on the Friar Blas del Castillo approach, and I took it, bought a chain, and this thing just bounced off the rocks because it's very viscous. It just sort of bounced along. That didn't work. So my Italian colleagues said, hey, we got the solution for you. And they gave me their silver suit. And so that was great. And they also gave me the long pole. And of course, these are the long poles that people make ashtrays out of without their silver suit when they're Italians and trying to make a living out of this. So you know, I was well protected in my silver um, suit. Well, the next day, they forgot the pole. So there's an ice axe. That worked. That worked. It worked for a couple of days, and that was great. The wind would be blowing this way. We'd sort of calculate it. There's the wind blowing away. And then one day, it's really viscous, and I keep trying to get a sample. And next thing you know, the winds change direction, and there it is. It's starting to, you can see smoke starting to come off of my suit. And uh, my suit, the, it was a cheap Italian suit. Um, <laughs> Um, burned up, and you can see the burn on my suit there. And um, after that, I bought expensive Italian suits. <laughs> um, okay, the last part of the show that I'm going to talk to you about is a place that's near and dear to me, and um, and that is 
the, um, this volcano here is Nurungongo, and this is Nyamalagira. This is the border of Rwanda out here, and, Nurung, uh, and DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, right here. This is an area that five plus million people have been killed in by the war, or indirectly and directly by the war that's been propagated since the Rwandan genocide, and we don't pay much attention to it. Because why don't we pay attention to it? If this border remains porous, all these resources from the Congo, coltan, which provides columbite, is columbite tantalite, um, which is what coltan is short for, provides niobium, cassiterite, which provides tin, all that stuff is being pumped across. Our cell phones, our computers, all that stuff require this product. And so as a result, some individuals are getting very rich over in Rwanda and no and some you know some hustlers are getting rich here but no one is paying attention to that so that's a side topic what's really interesting here is that when the Belgians built Goma the city of Goma is right here they originally wanted to put it over here where Saki is but the problem is is, is Nyamalagira erupts about every two to three years and it is self-consistent humongous lava flows and the ash kept coming here they said well here's this dormant volcano let's build our city right there and unfortunately, if you look at this volcano, you have fractures through them. If you pick up a rug on the floor and handkerchief, you're going to get radial fractures. And here's this radial fracture coming right out of it. And this is the city of Goma, a million people right underneath this super active volcano and right in a fracture zone. And what's the problem about this, this volcano is the lavas are extremely interesting if you're a, a scientist. But they are made, um, they have 37% silica. They're um, really super silica undersaturated and they're extremely fluid. The lava flows they call black water because they travel at 40 kilometers an hour. You can't outrun these lavas when they first start erupting. They start to you know, thicken and, and, um, and homogenize or um, and become more viscous as a function of moving down the slope and cooling. But initially, they're super fluid. In fact, where the eruption happens oftentimes is just a paper thin layer. And then as it gets down the valley, it starts to cool off and thicken. But there is, is Goma. And there's been um, 1990, or 1977 and 2002, there's been eruptions. And some of the eruptions have happened, started right in town. They start on top of the mountain, but they also start in town because there's this humongous lava lake up there. And it's like having a humongous bucket of water over your head. Um, because you know it's it's got this humongous hydraulic head, and this is right after the 2002 eruption. 50% of the world's SO2 was being produced at this time out of um, um, Nurungongo, and this is you saw this slide before. This is the 2002 eruption that erupted right in town by the airport, and um, it um, destroyed 80% of the downtown area and its economy. It only killed about 200 people because people were able to scatter from it. And, um, but it displaced about 300,000. At that time, there was about 800,000 people in the town. Now there's over a million because it's a refugee, um, there's refugee camps everywhere. And this just shows, and of course these cars all rusted because the gas is coming out of, this is, this is the effect later on. Unfortunately, people don't heed the, the warning because this is the 2002 flow, and look at all these houses. Before that lava had cooled, people were marking out what their property boundaries were. And here's some people walking right next to the 2002 flow. It, it um, destroyed the runways at the airport and so forth. There's a disaster waiting to happen here. And because there's a war, when we go to study it, we also end up with the Army. That's interesting. You know you're in a war zone when they start taking off their ranks. And, um, um, but my, sometimes my biggest fear is when someone throws a, a gun over their shoulder walking up a hill right in front of you and the, the, the barrel's aimed right at you and you know they have a round in the chamber so you learn French really quickly to ask them not to, to um, point their gun at you as you walk along. We have tons of porters um, to carry our gear. In fact, on the National Geographic trip, we had 150 of these porters to carry mostly National Geographic's gear to the top. Um, this is um, my colleague Jacques Derrière, who um, just died this last um, year from, um, or two years ago now, from liver cancer. But this is standing on the summit. He was instrumental in the UNOPS program in working with people in these eruptions. So my goal was to go down and collect all these lava flows going down here to understand the history of the volcano as well as gases. This place has the world's largest lava lake. 
It's 200 meters. It's bigger, you know, 200 meters in, in, in diameter um, is humongous. And so we went down onto these various terraces. All these terraces represent different periods in the volcano when it was um, a lava lake at that level. So right now it's quite down, it's quite low, but it's still the largest lava lake in the world. And here it is. And of course, we go down. Unfortunately, I, if you're used to rock climbing, if you're at all familiar with it, you have solid gear and volcanoes. We're pounding in these stakes this long to anchor our gear off of. It's sort of a whole different kind of adventure because um, you're certainly going down. And you also worry because it's very sharp rock about your ropes. So we often double our ropes and so forth. This is the lava lake right there. And you can see it's, it's phenomenal. As I said, this stuff is very fluid, so the gases just stream through this volcano. And um, it has a humongous CO2 flux, a humongous SO2 flux. It's a very strange composition, really important from a pure scientific um, perspective, but also really important because here's this war-torn region. If there's a volcanic crisis, we're going to have another humanitarian crisis. And I think it's worth the, the, you know, the effort and the risk that we take to go and study this. So this last year, of course, there's this National Geographic article. There's the lava lake, and you can see the, the, the lava flowing over. This is, of course, in Peter's photo. And, um, and um, he sort of ended up when you know, he sort of pushed me to go there, and I wanted to sample the walls for a while. He ended up going right over where this, this overflow went at one point. It, it had hardened and solidified. But he got to the top, immediately was too hot, and ended up sort of jumping off and, and rolling down this hill. Um, so I went when I was down there, actually collected one of these zero-age lavas, waited for it to overflow, and then I waited until it sort of calmed down again, the activity moved, and then climbed up this, this vertical part of the wall um, so I could actually be in a high point and sort of just for, it was phenomenal. And so here, here I am climbing up. That's me in my silver suit. Um, I got at one point, and actually it was so hot, my shoes started to melt, and I was like, well, you know. Anyways, um, <laughs> that being said, there I am. And I'll tell you what, I cried. I've never seen anything like that. If you imagine standing at the end of a football stadium and watching this, this lava just, bound, you know, just bubbling up above you, I don't cry too often, a little bit, but um, I cried a lot there. I just you know, brought tears to my eyes. So all that being said, um, I'm pretty much done. I want to thank a couple people first. This is um, myself, but this is my longtime buddy, um, John Caddo, the photographer who took 99% of the, the photos that I just showed, um, a great friend. Uh, he's someone I trust, will put down the camera and watch my back, and I'll watch his back. And, and so I can't say enough about my buddy, John Cato. Um, the next people that I want to thank real quickly is, um, well, mainly I want to thank Carla, but Jason's for years kept my computers going when I was at Woods Hole and his daughter, Rianne, but she's the one who did the graphic arts for me. And as you see, she's still walking around. She, I think I work her so hard, she ends up getting carpal tunnel syndrome. And then lastly, I can't thank my family enough. This is us up in Yellowstone, and um, there's my wife and daughter and son. And um, with that, thank you. We'd like to take some questions. If you can raise your hand, if you have a question, we'll find you. I'm supposed to wait for the microphone to come to you, so. Um. Hi, I wanted to ask that um, when you're going to the volcanoes um, and the gas is coming up, do you get symptoms that you know the gas is getting too toxic for you, or I how do don't. you know? I, I get the first smells of it, and I put on a gas mask. Right. Uh, my colleague, Dario Tedesco, actually goes down into that crater, down to the, not to the bottom level, without a gas mask. I, he's a dear friend, and I respect him highly, except for in that regard. <laughs> because, and, you know, as I said, I, I, you know, I, I ski and climb, and I'm protecting my lungs the best I can. I don't smoke also, you know, so. That's. I have the next question over here. Oh, okay. You guys are just one big light. No. <laughs> is it a myth that there's typically seismic activity prior to a volcano? No, it eruption? is not a myth. Okay. I sort of touched on it briefly. But no, it's a very strong um, indicator of um, probably one of the first indicators 
that we rely on to see that there's a uh, eruption about to happen. In fact, what I do before I go down in a volcano is I'm trying to sort of work with the seismologist to tell me uh, if something's changed in that signal. Because if you bring magma up into a system, of course you're gonna deform it and you're gonna cause earthquakes. There is one example where, um, and now they understand it, but there was a volcano, Galeris, which actually there was a, a volcano workshop and several volcanologists, it was a, one you could walk down into, and several volcanologists went into it and there was actually an indicator on the seismic record that they didn't understand at the time, an eruption happened and a couple of these volcanologists um, were killed and, um, and some, Stan Williams has written a book about it because it was a real, um, you know, it was, a, it was something that we didn't understand at the time. So as, we, as, as I said, there's different kinds of volcanoes and different seismic signals, and we're getting better at all of them. I have a question to you. Uh... I have a question about the volcano explosivity index. Yes. Um, it looked like it was totally based on the amount, like volume of magma that came out, but what if you had two volcanoes and they both put out one cubic kilometer of magma, but one of them did it in like 24 hours and one of them did it in like a month. Wouldn't the first one be more explosive? Would it have a higher number on the index? Yeah, no, it's, it's based upon the volume that's actually erupted. And so, you know, you actually sort of use that. And then also it, part of that index and with sort of a multifaceted index is, you know, whether it'll inject into the stratosphere or the troposphere only and stuff like that. Next question over here. What, what do you do with all the samples you collect? How do you keep track of them and then what happens to them? Well, I'm, <laughs> yeah, as a, a graduate student advisor, that's an important question <laughs> because they better keep track of the samples and I've had students. Um, I actually once went in on mass spec and, and this guy had these standards and they were, they were all the wrong numbers, but then I was able to play mix and match and then I said, well, these are standards, so we know the numbers for those, but you've got to throw away your whole sample set and start over. So, yeah, we spend a lot of time archiving them and collecting them. There's, you know, it's, it's been an art and, a, and, well, a science of, you know, an aspect of being a careful geologist is to take careful notes in the field and then label your samples in multiplicity. And when I ship samples, I actually break little chips off. And then there's warehouses full of samples. And um, so, you know, I often end up working because um, basalt's very homogenous, so I can work with a pretty small sample. So I have, you know, I mean, people hassle me for about what I'm going to do with my sample collection out there at Bill Nye. But yeah, we, um, I have drawers in my labs and then a whole warehouse full of samples elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. You talked a lot about uh, gases having a lot of effect on the climate. Uh, recent studies have shown, uh, in terms of dust traveling from deserts, oh, yeah. having a major impact on the climate. Have you done any studies in terms of the volcanic ash actually having any type of effect? On the climate? Yeah, well, the I atmosphere mean, temperatures? Like uh, well, you saw I showed those, those, those slides that showed that they have a cooling effect because they increase the reflectivity um, of the Earth. And so, yeah, there's, there's, that's not my, necessarily my expertise, right. but um, Casper Amon, who is um, now at NCAR, um, did a lot of work that, in that direction. Cool. Thank, you. Thank you. Good question. I have the next question. Um, do you know how volcanoes get their names? <laughs> Good question. Um, I, there, it's a cultural aspect. And um, so, you know, people um, name them, you know, based upon sort of their culture. And so, you know, if you, um, like for instance, um, you know, a lot of people say Vulcan Messiah, and it's a Messiah volcano, because Messiah is actually an indigenous name and so you don't want to necessarily mix the Spanish with it, but so um, it was a local name. Um, Yellowstone was because, you know, the rocks, all the sulfur around there, that's where that name came from. Um, Long Valley, because of the Long Valley. Um, I don't know where um, names like Etna and Stromboli come from, but, you know, so they're, they're, they're named culturally, and it's, it's an interesting one. In fact, I know someone who discovered a new volcano, it was an undersea volcano, off of um, in the islands of Samoa, and um, he actually proposed a name, 
and um, the name, I'm trying to remember the, the actual name, um, but in, in the end, the village settled on a different name, or the, the people in the, the area in Samoa settled on a different name because they didn't like the name that my colleague chose. And, um, and so, you know, it was, because it was actually, it wasn't, it, he, it essentially, um, it was culturally insensitive, well, I don't want to say insensitive, but it, they didn't like it. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> so they came up with a different name. So that's a very good question. Thank you. I'm, I'm getting good. I, I'm trainable. I look over there, and then I look over there. <laughs> uh, Nera Gongo, uh, the composition you had just, uh, you know, generally alluded to it. Um, how does the composition relate to its viscosity and the underlying rock or the source of the magma? Excellent question. Um, so it's really interesting. Nyama Laguerra, which is his sister volcano, it, it's also silica undersaturated, but it's sort of more typical of what you'd see on these bassinites. And so that has about 50% silica, and Nurungongo is about 37. So that's the first order. Um, difference that you see, but what it means is that there's something different in the, the area that melts beneath Nurungongo, and it actually, our research, a, a paper that we published not that long ago, um, shows that it's moving more to what's known as carbonatitic, and, and as it moves more towards carbonatitic, it's more like Oldinho Lingai, um, which is in Tanzania, and so um, the, 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 all, you know, all the reasoning we came up with is, of course, the mantle is quite different underneath those two. But that's interesting because they're so close to each other, and yet you have this, this, this difference. And so that clearly means that the melting region under those two areas is very different, very close together. So it starts to put an understanding on the, on the scale of heterogeneity in the mantle. Has there been any, uh -huh. Has there been any uh, decisions on what causes carbonatites? I mean, they're still arguing over it? Yes, we are. Um, so, you know, I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, so people often thought it was an immiscibility, and, you know, and, but clearly you have to have a lot of, you know, um, um, ma volatile components in the source. And there's, there's been some phenomenal work by experimentalists um, over time. You know, you're asking some outstanding questions here. Um, there's, you know, over time trying to understand how um, volatile components in the mantle influence, they, they lower the melting temperature, but they also influence the composition of the melts that come out. And uh, it's interesting because those are old experiments, and I've just been funded for a lot of work on this kind of stuff. And my colleague at Woods Hole, we actually put in a grant together, and they said, this is a great experiment that you want to do with your work in Antarctica, but write two grant proposals. And so now he's going to write a grant proposal for some experiments to understand this alkaline volcanism and how volatile components play a part. And so but we know there's a lot of water in the mantle. We know that there's a lot of CO2 in the mantle. But they, you know, it's clear that they are, um, you know, it's it's heterogeneous. Whether it's homogeneously heterogeneous is, you know, always an argument. But it's heterogeneous on some scale. Uh, carbonatites are the more common in the Precambrian. I mean, can we change the, the composition of the upper mantle? <laughs> um, there's a lot of kimberlites and carbonatites that are 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 associated with Precambrian. Um, Samples and you know, but they're they're not exclusive to the Precambrian. That's for sure. Um, but um, yeah, the, you know, clearly the mantle's been changing, you know, composition over time. You know, in fact, there's also during the um, the you know the Precambrian, there was a lot of um, kinds of rocks that um, represent really comatiites that represent these really sort of high temperature melts and so forth. So it's a it's the basic science that I love to study. So thank you for those questions. Question over here. Hi. Um, have you ever uh, you know, studied the changes in the in, in, in terms of predicting a volcano? The changes in the behavior of the animals in the area from the I don't know changes in the water temperature or from gases coming up out of the ground and and what causes that or how you can yeah, use no, that. Yeah, no, I've never actually. Um, spend a lot of time looking at whether, you know, I mean, like with tsunamis, you know, the animals seem to know to, to go up to highlands, and the humans seem to think that there's something amazing because the water just disappeared and they can go get <laughs> things out there, you know, and we're getting smart because we're trainable, although if I'm trainable, I'll stay in this lighted region. Um, anyways, um, so, you know, it's, but the impact 
is, is incredible. Um, you know, Yellowstone, you see this impact. You can see, and, and it's interesting, it's very controversial if you're a Wyomingite, um, about the wolves. But, you know, um, when there was no wolves in Yellowstone, the elk herds just blossomed. And now that they're reintroducing the wolves, they're, you know, actually maybe putting that in balance. And I should say maybe because I come from Wyoming. Um, but no, but, you know, they are put in balance. And an interesting thing was, was um, over in the Geyser Basin area where, um, you know, there's a lot, like Old Faithful and so forth, the elk herd there um, doesn't age very well because they chew this grass and then they, their teeth rot out and then they die of starvation. And, and, and um, you know, whereas when the wolf population was high, it's been suggested by um, wildlife biologists that work for the park that it actually, um, these animals, um, you know, they didn't exist in this part of the park because they, you know, they weren't sort of forced into less desirable areas to live. And then, of course, the other effect that I can tell you from Yellowstone, because I think about that a lot, is in the winter, those thermal areas are warm and the animals find, you know, ground that they can lay on and so forth. And of course, then you have these inversions in temperature, you know, just like we have smog inversions in Denver and so forth like that. These animals lay down, the, the inversion seals the CO2 in and they, you know, it's like turning on the car, I guess, they, they don't wake up. So, you know, it's an, it's an interesting topic. It's not my specialty, but, you know, do, are there forecastable, could you use the animals to forecast as, a, as an interesting um, topic for sure. Back in 1974, 73, 74, the predictions were not on Mount um, uh, St. Helens, Helens exploding, but for Baker. Well, Baker is also there. No, but Crandall actually um, said that, um, that Mount St. Helens was going to erupt, but Mount Baker is also a phenomenal threat there. Um, so, you know, um, I can... I, you know, I can go back and pinpoint to um, what Crandall said, but Baker is also another one there. I mean, there's several along. Right now, they're worried about three sisters up there, and um, also Rainier's. Uh, you know, I mean, when this whole thing on Nurungongo came out, they, you know, the fact checker said they want to call this the most dangerous volcano in the world, and I said, well, maybe not. And um, they went on. They liked the title, so they went with it. But, um, you know, I mean, Mount Rainier's and, you know, that whole Cascadia is a real threat there for sure. Hi, thank you for that lecture. Um, it sounds like you work in some um, politically diverse areas. Um, I'm wondering how you kind of just practically um, work with local governments and kind of navigate permissions and visas and things like that. Um, well, in the the um, in Congo, for instance, um, you, I work with people that work with UNOPS, you know, or, or um, and that's you know part of the UN um, disaster assistance that they have there, and so they can sort of help with the permits, and then you know you will start working with a large program like National Geographic. They have what they call I love this term fixers, um, and um, and so um, you know that helped uh, facilitate the 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 whole process. Um, in the end, you know, it, it's, it's always politically charged because, you know, you go to Italy and if, you know, you go in there, rush in there with a U.S. team without having Italian colleagues, it's, it's offensive and probably not going to work very well. So you, you develop a rapport with the local volcanologists or, or you know, in the case of the, the, you know, and even now in the Congo, in, in you know, Goma, there's the Goma Volcano Observatory. And so you work with them. You leave, you know, I oftentimes leave stuff behind, um, you know, that is, you know, helps facilitate the development of their program. Um, I'll tell you, you know, working in national parks, you have to be extremely sensitive to all sorts of issues. Working in Yellowstone, you need permits, and you need to adhere to those permits, or else they won't let you work there again. And so you really need to sort of have... Um, a cultural sensitivity, whether it's our own government or if it's other governments, to make sure that you're working within the confines of, of what they need you to do. How many volcanoes do you visit in a year? <laughs> My wife would say as little as possible. <laughs> uh, no. Um, 
it just depends on, on certain years. I have a pretty strict rule, and it's not completely been applied to in Yellowstone because I'm trying to really better understand. I'm trying to understand water-rock interactions there. But I try not to go back to a volcano until I've written a paper about my last field season. You know, sometimes it takes two field seasons, but typically I really try to make sure that, because a lot of volcanologists, they, they zoom out there to every volcano, they're young and single, and they zoom all around the place. But you, the only way to really pull this off the way we're supposed to in, in the scientific system is to write papers and, you know, peer-reviewed papers that go out. So as a result, you'll, um, you know, I sort of, this next year, I, you know, I go to Yellowstone multiple times every year. Um, and the nice thing about Yellowstone is I can take my family and hopefully you guys will come visit. Um, and this is the daughter of, of Carla, who's the graphic artist. But, and, you know, so I can take my family there. I go to Ecuador um, several times, um, you know, in this next year I'm going back to Antarctica, but I just actually submitted um, another paper there on, on Mount Erebus. So I, my, goal, it's, I, my goal is to, is to produce more science. You know, as I've always said, I've never, you know, this adventure is really cool, but I've never met a good scientist that couldn't sit down and work at a desk and model, do mathematics, you know, sometimes simple models, and write a paper because that's what our responsibility is as a scientist. So some years it'll be two or three, and some years it'll be one or zero. And um, because, you know, my goal is to get the rocks, take them home to my laboratories, do my work there, take the gases I measured, take them to the laboratories or, or take the measurements and, and work them up into a scientific paper. Volcanoes? Do you think you visited last year? Ah, yeah, you're getting. Um, last year was a low year, so um, two. And um, but there's been um, a few years where I've done five in a year, and um, and um, it just sort of depends on the schedule and 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 what I'm doing. But I often I end up I like Italy, and so I end up going to those volcanoes quite a bit. Um, <laughs> I love Ecuador and go down there, and um, you know I keep getting pulled back to the Congo. That's good questions, um, but I, you know, I, I will tell you this: I used to fly over 100,000 miles a year, and last year I flew less than 25,000. And I just know that because the airlines keep track of that stuff for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have the last question okay. from this young man up here. He's very eager. <laughs> Better, I um, bet it is good. <laughs> From um, how long did it take take the U.S. to recover from the Yellowstone volcano eruption? So, if we had a super eruption, how long would it take to recover from that? Excellent question. Um, you know, I mean, as you saw, there's you know the effects can be pretty long lived in terms of months to you know even years. You know, um, the, the, the one thing I actually, this, this really starts to tie down between the difference in human life and time scales and geologic time scales. And, um, and so, you know, on a geological time scale, it's quick. In a human life time scale, it can be tens of years. I mean, you saw, for example, you know, on, on Pinatubo, we were looking at the, the atmospheric effects three years later, and that was small. Um, We've never seen a super eruption, so you know what those effects. Um, you know, climate modelers, you know, can actually plug in numbers into their computers and 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 probably predict that. I've never seen anybody do that. They're always they use this a lot to do what they call tuning their models and you know go oh well if we change you know our model didn't quite match so we're going to change that which will be better for um, climate prediction. Um, in fact, I think a lot of their attention is diverted to climate prediction, but. Um, it's, you know, on a geological time scale, it's nothing, which is sort of, in a weird way, comforting about anything we do to the earth is, you know, it's like, it doesn't care, um, but we care, and our grandchildren care, and so forth. Um, but, yeah, no, I'll give you an example of what I do for geologic time scale for my intro class. I have a chalkboard up there. I draw a little line about this long. And I have to set it up so someone gets my computer. And then I say, okay, this is human time scale. And then I walk out, it's a very a room like this, but we enter in those doors, or, um, and I take that chalk, and I walk out, I do this on a Thursday, because I teach on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then I walk, making a line up the wall, and I just keep walking, and then I never come back. <laughs> and, 
until the following Tuesday. And then I come in that door, and I take this line, and I go across. Like, so, so, it's, it's. I would say, you know, tens of years at a minimum. Tens of years at a minimum, just based upon Pinatubo. And I'm shooting from the hip on that one. But, you know, based upon what we saw on Pinatubo, it's going to take tens of years. And then, and then we'll recover. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Ken.